-hmm. All right, so we're live now. All right, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I am here virtually with uh, uh, Marty and Rach, who and right, yeah, Rach. Rach, yeah, Rach. And I. Yeah. What is what is happening? Something is happening on my computer. No. Okay, now it's up. Okay, good. Um, we'll wait for a couple of minutes until uh, everybody gets the notification to join us live, and then we'll get started. I'm very excited to have you here because I've been following you online for a while. Mm -hmm. Thanks um, for having me. As well, yeah, we're happy to be here. <laughs> yeah. Um. Right. Yes, excellent. Um, super happy. So let me um, do this for a second. I'll have you both with me on the screen for a second um, while I fix a small logistic problem that I'm having. No worries. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I think I found the problem. Um, perfect. Good, perfect. I think it's back to good now. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for bearing with me for my small little issue. I was hearing myself twice. Um, and it is because I had YouTube open and today for the first time we're streaming live on YouTube. So I could hear myself on my headsets while also speaking to you. And that was a bit weird. Uh, yeah. So I have fixed that now. So we'll start again. Um, so tonight I'm here with Rachel and Marty who are in Australia, um, I guess uh, in semi-lockdown and trying to weather the storm that is hitting us all. And I'm mm -hmm. very excited to talk to you because I've been following you online for a while and I was very excited that you were almost about to finish uh, your quest to visit all the countries in the world. And then yeah. unfortunately you had to put this on standby. So hopefully you'll be able to go back on the road soon. Um, for those who do not know you, um, I think that we can start and you can introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about uh, what it is that you are doing. For yeah, sure. yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having us, Mara, as well. I kind of been chatting over the years when we travel, uh, so it's nice to actually uh, catch up this way. Um, so who we are, really, let us introduce ourselves. So my name is Mari, which is short for Martina. Uh, I'm originally from Slovakia, but live in Australia. And, and I'm Rach. Uh, I'm Australian. So yeah, and I guess we're known as the very hungry nomads, so Mari and Rach, Rach and Mari. And, uh, as you mentioned, we're currently on a trip to visit every country in the world, uh, which has been really in 15 years in the making. Uh, wow, 15 years in the making. Yes, yeah, so we both have been traveling pretty much for the last 15 years. So, uh, but it was a conscious decision about four years ago. Yeah, maybe. Um, so we reached, like we've traveled through about 100 countries when the first time we kind of asked ourselves, like, is it possible to visit all countries? And then really like, who has done it. So we did a little bit of research and we both work in travel industry as well. We did a lot of research uh, that day, like how many countries there really are and and then how many people have seen every country and we found out that there were not that many. Uh, that there's that saying that more people went to space than visiting every country. I, I, I believe you actually mentioned that it's 120 or? Yeah, in, in this website, Nomad Mania, I could count 118 uh, people of which only eight were women. And I know there are some women that are not on the list that have done it. So definitely there's more than 118, but let's say there's maybe 150 people who are alive and have been to all the countries. That's not a lot. Yeah, yeah. Usually we say like there's about under 200 or so. And I guess the biggest shock was that there were not that many women, especially when we looked, uh, we could only really find two or three. Um, so then we were kind of like, well, this doesn't make sense. And if women can do everything, then why not see every country? So we looked into like, what does it take? Um, 
to do so. So we kind of planned and saved, didn't we? Yeah, made a plan and saved um, kind of over the next two years and logistically yeah. thought how we're going to do it and then set off about two years ago. We had... Uh, yeah, April 2018. 2018, we had uh, just under 90 countries remaining. So, and um, yeah, and we were hoping to have been done by uh, April or last, May, month. <laughs> last month. Last it, it was all lined up, but obviously um, events yeah. happened, so we couldn't get there. But so that's where we are now. We have nine left. Um, nine yeah, countries, but so you, I think you count 196, right, rather than 193. Or 195. We, yeah, yeah, so we do. We count 195. Originally, we just sort of looked at and like, what are we going to take? Because there's always this dispute, like, what is really a country? And when it comes to travelers, I think we would go up to much higher number. Um, so we thought, okay, well, we'll just stick with 193. That's a UN country plus two Vatican and Palestine. And then we we were aiming to like any disputed territory to visit. So uh, many travelers would go. Like they would say there's 197 because Taiwan and Kosovo are two countries that are recognized by many countries. So, so it kind of, and we've been to Taiwan, we've been to Kosovo. Um, so, but that's, there that was a, like we pretty much planned to celebrate last country in Samoa uh, last month, but it didn't happen. And so 186 in, nine left. Yeah. But could be so five years. So your last country was supposed to be Samoa. So you were supposed to do the ones that you have missed before going on the Pacific uh, tour. Uh, we were, yeah, we were supposed to say our next, like our plan was actually then go through. I think our next slide has actually the map of where we um, where we still need to go. So this is kind of a little visual for anyone that's watching. Uh, so um, those little red dots, I do apologize for the Pacific if the geography isn't correct. Uh, slightly off, but uh, Libya, Eritrea, Israel, Palestine, and this is pretty much in the order we were going to go. And then Palau, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Kiribati, and Samoa. And obviously, when everything kind of, when COVID stopped us, uh, our next country was Libya. So we had to fly home kind of via Thailand. So. So you still have a few countries in the Pacific left. I thought that maybe, because I know that you had so many problems, right? Because the borders started yeah. to close okay. and the Pacific is so remote. There's no <laughs> way to get out of it, right? Yeah, and that's, we were already had like our plane tickets and everything sort of sorted to go to Solomon, Solomon Islands, Islands, Papua, Papua New Guinea, Kiribati. Kiribati. Yeah, we were supposed to do those three back in yeah February. Back in February when it all sort of started, but falling apart and we're getting stranded yeah, and that's, we got um, stranded there yeah. they so. were supposed to be done but so at that yeah. stage we thought oh well we'll just we'll we'll you know we'll go and travel through the region on the way to Samoa mm -hmm. and even at this stage like we were aware because the reason why we got stuck in Micronesia was actually due to the restrictions that a lot of these Pacific islands have had in place and there are still islands that are COVID free because of the really early approach. Yeah. So, um, but we still kind of had this illusion, like, oh no, we'll just keep on traveling. Like it's not really happening over there. And I think as well at the time, everything was changing. It depend, it, it really mattered where you were in the world and how you felt what's happening. There were still people traveling going like, you know, nothing's happening and here. And then others people were already almost in full lockdown. So, yeah, but yeah. Visual. Well, at least you have nice countries and close to Australia, I guess, left yeah. for the end, right? Samoa, yeah. is, is Samoa still the plan for, for it to be the end? That was um, on purpose, to be close-ish close, close -ish to home yeah, and we, relatively yeah. a few easy ones. Yeah. You know, we, don't, we don't know if you're going to keep Samoa anymore. We just, we're not sure. <laughs> like, we could see that, like, for example, Eritrea might not open up for two years and then we're like, yeah. well, let's just see what we can. So I think it's going to change. I think it's going to we just yeah. We'll see. We have to adapt always. Yeah. You have a very, uh, yeah, you have a very uh, complicated. If you had to plot those nine countries in like some logical way, they are really not. Unfortunately, they're like spread across the world, right? It's not even like logical. Yeah, this doesn't seem like logical, but um, we actually we have if for people who well maybe follow. We came to Australia and it was mostly because we couldn't get to the countries in Africa. Uh, because of the visa, so like Libya and Eritrea, like we got our visa here in Australia uh, because of the conditions, that, and that depends, like for Australians, you need to get your visa at home, but I, I can get a visa on arrival, so 
sometimes those little differences between our passports change the way that obviously we travel as well. So yeah, right. it's easy. <laughs> no, that's always another. Just um, throw that in there and deal with that. But we have, <laughs> we have very lucky because we we both have very good passports to travel with. But mm -hmm. we have definitely got a lot of visas in the last year, especially. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, for the ones that you have left now, I guess that the only visas you need are Libya and Eritrea, right? The rest are all free. Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, uh, it's a good list to have left. I think, uh, you know, at least some of them are, majority of them are nice and interesting countries. So whichever is going to make the last one, at least is going to be an interesting place to finish. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We're looking forward to all of them. That's yeah. true. So. Yeah. Actually, yes, I have been to Samoa, Kiribati. I was in Kiribati last year. Uh, Solomon, Palau. Um, I haven't been to the others, uh, but yeah. um, you know, I was also planning to turn four. I turned forty this year, and I was planning to celebrate in PNG, which is the only country I have left in this part of the world that I haven't been to. And I kept keeping it, and I wanted to go. And my birthday is middle of August, so I wanted to celebrate it during the festivals, the Mount Hagen festival. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that's also on hold for me. It could still happen. Maybe we'll, we'll yeah, see. we're going to come to you when we need information. Yeah, I mean, I, I might join you in some of your last countries. I wouldn't mind to visit some of these ones again. Why not? <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Lee is asking, planning question. Do you divide the planning task between you as a solo traveler? I know the time to plan a three-month trip is massive. Have you found a shortcut for the planning process? Uh, nice. We wish we found a shortcut. I think the more you travel, the easier it gets as in like you get better with resources and um, it just gets a little bit easier but it's still it just consumes you and sometimes you can spend two weeks planning what do I see in the city and that sometimes we, we have to go to places when we just kind of like oh, I wish I had more time to kind of prepare what I want to do so we kind of like we are always planning we're planning ahead like two months ahead how to get to some of these countries but then yeah we also still planning like what are we doing tomorrow or even where we're going to stay and yeah, how we're going to get there. That's all kind of done the night before or, or whatever, you yeah. know? I mean, and I, and I have to say like Rachel's all the food planning. So <laughs> yeah. she usually chooses where to eat and what to eat and how to eat. And Marty's the, she's a logistical magician. She's a navigator yes. um, and she's, yeah. So this is how you split it. One takes care of the food and the other one takes care of the logistics. <laughs> Yeah, so it does. I think it does help think in that. Um, but we, when we're speaking about like solo female travelers, we both done a lot of travel uh, solo as well. So I've done my round the world trip. You have done. Um, so we know what is it like as well. So um, there's also, yeah. there's certain advantages and challenges. I feel like when I was traveling on my own, sometimes I wish I had that extra person. But then also like you make more effort like in hostels and just go, oh, them. hey, you know, and where are you from? Where are you going? So you meet more people. Sometimes we see that as well. And especially when we come across, right, we met a lot of like solo female travelers. So we always try to engage because we know how it is and sometimes it's hard. And yeah, um, so we always try to make the effort as well. Yeah. Too. But there's so many amazing tools on there out there now compared to 10 years ago, you know, with iPhones and apps <laughs> and <laughs> online um, things. So if you use them all properly and, you know, with lots mm. of practice, it does get easier, like Marty said. Yeah. So that's the split, yeah? So one one takes care more of the logistics and the other one take care, takes care more of the food. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> and Lee has, Lee has a follow-up question. Do you have a, a list of the best resources? Yes, they do. In fact, uh, um, they are at the end of the presentation and I will paste them in the comments. Yeah. Yes. No worries. As many questions as you want. She says, sorry, too many questions. No problem. <laughs> they are also no. in the group. You can always uh, ask them uh, later as well. So let no me see. So um, just to recap also what you were saying at the beginning, though, you said you started planning this four years ago, but uh, and you've been traveling for how long now? Uh, so it was pretty much two years. Like we left April 2018 and we had to return back on the end of March 2020. So it was just short of two years. And yeah. you had planned that you were going to finish it in around two years. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, well, you were already at one hundred then when you started. Uh, yeah, just I think that. it was like one hundred and eight or nine. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think the hardest thing is not to go to countries we already have been when you're in the like 
when we were in Europe, like you kind of wanted, like, oh, let's just go back to because we're place. here and <laughs> yeah, or like stay lo stay longer as well. Like there's certainly countries we visited, and you could spend a month. Um, we talk about Madagascar it's just in a second, and we could easily spend more time there. And when we travel overland, it's a little bit easier because you can literally just keep going as you wish. Once you commit to some flights, you kind of locked in and you have to go with the flow, but um, we have yeah. places to return to. And obviously we, we do have to look at the budget and if we spend month in every country, then it, five years later, we still go in, so. And the money's gone. Yeah, and the money's gone, so yeah. yeah. It's, it's, right. yeah it's gone. But you're not doing it too fast, right? I mean, in the end, a couple of years to no. 200 countries, so that means that you're spending about a week it, in each place, so. Exactly, and it kind of balances out. So there, there certainly are like some island nations that in Caribbean, like you can easily spend two weeks um, in just like on the just say in Grenada. But um, sometimes, like three days in an island, still gives you a, a better understanding. So to say, like you can't compare a small island with, let's just say, Mexico. Like we spend four months crawling through Mexico, and we still want to see more. So. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of balances out like in certain places we spend more time and then some smaller countries, San Marino, we spend literally, yeah. um, you know, day or two. So yeah, balances out a little bit. Exactly. Cool. Mm -hmm. So I had put together some questions to ask them so that they could prepare uh, some of the typical questions or some of the questions that I had. Um, like, you know, what are your most underrated countries? Yeah. So this is eight of them that we think are really underrated. Um, Georgia, if you haven't been there, put it on the bucket list. It is stunning. We didn't know so much about it before we uh, went into Georgia. And uh, we came out a couple of weeks later and absolutely loved it. Just the people, the food, the scenery, um, the wine, just just the whole thing, I guess. Um, absolutely loved it. So, And it's affordable too. So yeah. big, big win. And it's super close to Europe, you know. Yeah. Um, very, very good for solo female travelers yeah. as well. Very safe. Uh, Oman was a real surprise. I mean, everyone told us it was going to be terrific, mm -hmm. and there's plenty to see. Uh, we stayed in desert, as the picture shows, but there are fortresses, there are national parks. We've seen turtle hatching yeah. um, on the beach, um, the main city. People were really hospitable, and uh, I know that there's even companies that do tours for those who are a little bit like, you know, um, they maybe need a bit more support, we hired a car and went around because that's the only thing like you do need a car to get around or someone that drives you around. Yeah, for sure. Um, Macedonia, like, again, um, another one that we come out and went, oh, wow, it's yeah. uh, it's beautiful and uh, really affordable, the architecture, the food, the position. I, don't, I just don't think people in Europe are talking about it as much enough, as yeah. enough, not near enough as they should. Even the picture is in uh, Lake Orid, and it was a certainly a highlight. It was yeah. absolutely amazing there. Definitely want to go back. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a nice melting point of cultures as well, and mm -hmm. and it's and it's very affordable. Again, like I know a lot of people say, like Europe is expensive. It doesn't have to be. There's plenty of countries yeah. that um, you can get a lot. I think I don't know if you pay thirty euros for an apartment. Yeah. Um, um, actually, it was a room in a hostel, which was yeah. So it was a great vibe as well. Yeah, yeah I thought um, North, North, um, North Macedonia was very good. In fact, I visited so many wineries there. <laughs> I, got, I had the feeling this was the purpose of my trip, just to go from winery to winery. <laughs> yeah, that's probably the same in Georgia. I mean, like the wine is just phenomenal. So yeah. And they say Georgia gives you a visa for a year as well. Um, so there's like no problem in living there for a whole year. Yeah, yeah. there's now like a lot of digital nomads actually. Um, Selling that it's in really Georgia. boomed. Yeah, oh, no. yeah. We can't wait to go back. Um, now, Iran. I think anyone that has been to Iran will tell you that it's just phenomenal. Um, we always talk about when it comes to hospitality and people that Iran is just simply number one, mm -hmm. uh, the most friendly as an hospital of people uh, we've met. A lot to see. I know it's difficult for some nationalities with visas. I think Canadians and Americans, and I think even British passport holders need to book a tour and but there are some some options uh we've traveled independently like overland from actually Turkmenistan and mm -hmm. had just yeah fantastic time so yeah yeah um Colombia yeah. Yeah. had some pictures that I think uh, uh I think I think we have Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia yeah um big one with hands down I think one of our top five in Africa for sure um Ethiopia was 
incredible in terms of diversity and it was beautiful there. It was so gorgeous, like everything's green, the countryside, um, the, the food again. I'm always going to mention the food because I'm total yeah. foodie. But you like we, the food in Ethiopia because I find the food is probably the lowest part. Oh, they, I mm. loved it. Yeah, yeah, loved it. And I think, I mean, a lot of injera, you know, with the, the different colors. Yeah. But uh, injera, not like, but injera has that sort of, you know, like for anybody who hasn't tried injera, is what, what you're holding on the left, bottom left yeah. of the of the picture here, right? So yeah. it's like this sort of, I don't know, like a flatbread with fermented something, right? It has like a vinegary fermented taste. Yeah, so. <laughs> with a smallness, yeah, sometimes, yeah. yeah, and it can be, yeah, yeah, it can get a lot. But if when you're finished with uh, eating all the Ethiopian food, there's always something else you can find. I, I thought, like traveling around in Ethiopia, you know, yeah, there's always there other was, yeah. options if you wanted to, but I was happy enough just eating that. If it vegetarians or vegans, you'd be very, very happy, yeah. um, which is there. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we love the month. I mean, this monkey, this baboon looks pretty scary. It, no, they were super peaceful. So this is up in Seaman Mountains. So that, that, I think that's another thing, like <laughs> Ethiopia, yeah. like ticks for the culture. It takes for the, um, you know, wildlife, obviously, the food. So there's a lot of, like the first picture with the cross, that's Lali Bella. So that's um, churches okay. that are carved out of rock. And actually the last uh, bottom on the right, that's rage as well. Like they're huge. So pretty incredible. Uh, the monkeys, what are they called again? Galata? Galata. Yeah. yeah. They were super Galata peaceful. Monkeys. They they just eat grass and we were surrounded by them. Um, and they just... Like really beautiful. And just carry on. <laughs> mm, yeah. And then the last picture are sitting in a house with all these pots. So this is almost at the border of Somalia because we actually cross overland from Ethiopia to Somalia, a uh, city of Harar. And this is the traditional house. So as a, as a traveler, you can stay in, in a place in homestay. Mm. Um, and that it was just completely different to other parts. So again, like Ethiopia, there are different ethnicities come together, so different languages. And they all have different customs, so I guess you can yeah. really go and explore. Yeah, it's a cool can, blend. Yeah, we'd yeah. love to go back. Um, well, I think mm -hmm. you have pictures from Madagascar as well. Yes, we had to. Yeah, yeah. Madagascar was just a, a cool adventure. It kind of reminds us of how travel should be, I think. And it's a huge island, so I guess when we talk about Madagascar, um, you just have to ensure that you have enough time because distances to get around the country yeah, it um, takes a long time. yeah so you'd yeah. either depending on time you would choose a section or an you know north south east or west to sort of do um but it's very diverse in mm. terms you can see the boab yeah. boab trees there which is a big highlight um seeing national park there's amazing rock formations and climbing and then you've got incredible beaches where you can hire a you know a beautiful beach bungalow for mm. 30 dollars a night and Quite eat like a queen, you know. Um, and I think for us, like yeah. Madagascar was really hard to plan because we didn't really know how long it's going to take because everyone warned us, like, oh, you need more time. So I remember we actually wrote a two-week itinerary for Madagascar for someone just to pick up and follow. Yeah. Uh, but as, men as Rach mentioned, like, the travel is very tough. Like, as in you go for nine, 12 hours in the bus. Like, everyone's friendly and I think even, yeah. like, the, the stops you can get decent food um obviously getting to these baobab trees like from the capital it takes nine to ten hours on like the vip bus mm -hmm. and then if you would like to visit the um the national park that sing me where that that bridge is the hanging bridge so you pretty much go hiking there that's another full day of driving so like you really early early mornings yeah. like 4 a.m mornings and yeah. late nights like it's tiring but it's super rewarding yeah. um yeah i so maybe in the future when there is a little bit more of uh, infrastructure when it comes to like better roads or as well flights, there are mm -hmm. flights, but they are quite expensive. I think it's 200 US dollars or something for the yeah. journey. Um, but I think that's such a gem in Africa. So I did. Yeah. yeah. I love See. Madagascar. I flew though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You did. I was, I worked in Madagascar. I had, uh, when I was a management consultant, I had a project in Madagascar uh, during the yeah. coup. Uh, in 2009, um, I had a project there ongoing and my team was on the ground on the day of the coup. Uh, 
Uh, I wasn't. I was in South Africa at the time uh, on that day. Uh, but uh, I love the country. And then I, I spent a week uh, traveling there at the end of the project uh, when I was living in South Africa. But I flew because I didn't have so much time. So yeah. um, I couldn't I couldn't spend days on the road, right? So we flew right. internally quite a bit. And then I also spent a few days in Nocive in the north. Uh, we rented a yacht and we went on a you know a little island hopping. And this was more than 10 years ago, right? So there were literally no tourists whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, you know. It is that yeah. If someone did actually, was like, if you want to fly up all the way to north, because then you can as well. Like it's far, uh, but then we end up going to the uh, San Il Mari, which is the picture of the palm tree. Mm. But it took us two days to get there, and then three days back to the cabin. Like it was just, you <laughs> know, it just but... went like it's just yeah. And then I don't even know that like flight wise was very connected, but we had a we had amazing time. Yeah, I think the country is beautiful and the people are, are beautiful and very friendly. And of course, they speak French. And also from a cultural point of view, it's a beautiful combination of cultures and heritage and, and like a mix of, uh, you know, uh, traders that would come from the from India and from other countries in Africa and arrived in Madagascar and then the French colonization and obviously mainland Africa. So people look very different from other countries. right? So yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah, we actually we said like it, it felt like we were still traveling around Southeast Asia in a form of because it was such an adventure and then everyone always helped you, but they were, you know, like Southeast Asia in the old days or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Beautiful country. What mm -hmm. else have you got? Mm -hmm. The hardest country to visit. Oh my God. Yes. And I think that you still have a couple of them quite hard, right? Um, Eritrea and yeah. Libya yeah. are from a logistics point of view a little bit hard to get to at least. And obviously Li Libya is still in conflict. Uh, yeah. But you visited all the other ones, right? So tell me, what are the hardest? Hardest is a wide definition, right? It can be anything. Yeah. It is a difficult definition because um, everyone has struggles with different ones. So we just thought we'll, we'll mention a few of those. Libya, we still yet to come. But as you mentioned, it, the, the country is um, currently unstable. So it's more the danger um, and you know, getting visa. Yemen, uh, mainland Yemen is very difficult to visit due to the civil war. Uh, so we visited, we went in October, November um, to the island of Socotra, which is really fascinating for people who have never heard of it. Uh, it's got endemic species, like very unique trees and just beautiful beaches. Like it's just like a little paradise. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like something like from Zanzibar brochure with the beaches. But, um, and we spent a week there um, and, and literally it's so cut off from the rest of the world. That there was only flight once a week and you had to go from Egypt so we are so happy that we actually made it because we don't know if that's gonna ever be resumed. Mm. Saudi Arabia which is now fairly easy to get an e-visa at the time. Do you we have any pictures from any of them? No right? I think that okay I don't want to like uh, get ahead of myself. <laughs> yeah. So yeah so I'll just touch on these four and then we can show some photos of Afghanistan and Syria. Saudi Arabia is now longer really difficult. There's an e-visa, but we spent a lot of yeah a lot of planning to get a visa and eventually got in. So Equatorial Guinea is a small, tiny country just of Africa um, across the equator. I actually speak Spanish in there, so which is kind of like it really blows you. But it's really difficult to get the visa unless you maybe live in Madrid or uh, you get in Berlin. There's a lot of people who struggle with that. So we were just like really lucky we got in. We, I think it was in Cameroon. Yeah. Uh, North Korea, I had to include it because if you have an American passport, it's almost impossible to pretty much get in. Mm -hmm. uh, if you do want to go in, then you have to book a tour and the visa is then pretty straightforward, but you have to go with a tour. Uh, and then Central African Republic, again, very unknown, but a country that's quite unstable. There's no embassy really uh, left. So it's usually like, planning um it's difficult and hard and expensive to get to uh so that would probably make our sort of list of eight but let's just go in about we can talk about afghanistan and i think the next slide has a couple of photos mm -hmm. uh from that country and yeah you can keep going you did an amazing job oh well <laughs> Rich can talk about all the food. So. Rich can talk about the food. Okay. <laughs> now, again, like Afghanistan, again, like any country that is difficult or dangerous to visit, uh, despite maybe sometimes of the post, it's not really just flying and then uh, you, you go around like you go backpacking. There's a lot of planning ahead. Like you get contacts with people on the ground, people who have been there. You check safety and so on. Um, we went to the city of Mazar-e-Sharif, which is in the north. Just consider 
like the safest, but it's considered that it's Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, and then the real highlight is in the top corner, you can see the huge shrine, um, which sometimes is referred to as a blue mosque. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. shrine of Sanali. Um, and that was definitely the highlight. We spent every day pretty much going around. You can see our outfit, which we picked up in the poll, I think. Yeah. Just to kind of blend in. Um, as you can see, there's a picture just underneath, and you can see the very typical um, dress that women still wear. It's called chadri. We, we normally, like, you often see it um, described as the blue burqa of, uh, because it was imposed during the Taliban. So, and for this city, like Mazari Sharif was under Taliban for three years, so people had a very strict set of rules. I, I think that uh, I don't really go into depth of it because there's a lot of that. Uh, but just you can still see women wearing it, and you can also see that men wear traditional clothing. So when we talk about like cultural differences from around the world, um, then I think being in Afghanistan was probably like the biggest difference, as in like you know what people eat, how they dress, and how everything is set up. Mm -hmm. Rach can explain maybe the food there in the middle. So. Ah, oh, the yeah. food, it's like the rest of that part of the world. The food is fantastic. Um, that was the typical food that we ate here was, you know, the, the slow-cooked lamb with the pilaf rice and um, yeah. all the bits and bobs, but typical kebab and uh, mm. amazing ice cream. Everything's made by hand and everything's made with love, I think, yeah. um, in any any country that ends in Stan. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, yeah. but uh, the food was incredible. The the architecture there is incredible, and the, the people really, really very, very warm people for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent. You flew you flew into Kabul and then from Kabul to Mazar -e Sharif. Yeah, so we exactly yeah. we flew to Kabul from Dubai and then flew to Mazar -e Sharif. We were actually surprised. Uh, we flew with a lot of women as well on that flight. There was, um, and then we also met. Uh, an American girl that was working for an NGO and eventually we swapped phones. Uh, she was probably thinking, why are these two crazy women, you know, coming to just Mazara? Uh, but we had actually some contacts with like local school teachers. Um, and so this girl that we met, she eventually, um, we got in touch and she said like, would you like to come for a lunch? My neighbor has invited us. So I think this is very common like the common question that we can ask is like traveling as a woman is very different. And um, in country like Afghanistan, when there's a set rules for men and women, we're actually somewhere in the middle of it, like the third gender because we foreign women. So we're allowed to do things that it's not the norm for uh, a women, like local women. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously when it comes to this invite, uh, we were able to go to uh, someone's house and the lady cooked amazing little dumplings and yeah. we were able to interact with women and like ask about you know their dreams and what they studied and and all of that and you would never be able to do that as a, as a man like you're not allowed to really speak to any women so I think that was as well like yeah it was a it was amazing experience, experience that yeah. day and the the, 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 theme, food. the girl that we met translated obviously because she yeah. spoke um exceptional diary, diary and, and yeah. they had the ladies had the lady and her daughter who was 26 and she had a a couple of children um they wanted to see photos of our family and it, a million million questions they were so intrigued and interested about our life and you know what, yeah. why we wanted to come to afghanistan and visit and um yeah it was a really nice afternoon yeah those kind Absolutely. of experiences you just sort of don't you can't really get anywhere so it was yeah it's lovely it was special mm -hmm. what, what are you staying were you staying at the hotel no we actually stayed uh, through a contact we met um we stayed at an English school, so they had, yeah. A so room. it's like a couch surfing pretty much <laughs> in the classroom. We stayed in a hotel the first night, mm -hmm. um, but then we've stayed, uh, yeah, we stayed at the school and because we were always surrounded by so English teachers, so they were young Afghani uh, teachers, guys, and it was, um, it was a holiday, so they were not working. So it was always nice because we can talk to someone, obviously, like the, the English was just phenomenal yeah. so we felt like we got a really good insight into the culture and they would take us around you know to show us the best ice cream shop and so on so yeah and we ate together in the evenings and just play, like played you know games played, on phones yeah and yeah drunk soda <laughs> drunk yeah. soda and yeah yeah it's good it's all really fun cool. 
-hmm. and then you also have Syria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this was, um, so we went to Syria in September. It was a, I think this was a country that when we were leaving 2018, almost everyone was asking like, oh my God, if you go to every country, are you going to go to Syria? Mm -hmm. And the truth is we were due to visit Syria back just before this, the war started. Um, like back then, was it like 2007? I think we were planning a big travel like across the region and we ended up going to Asia and then everything shifted. Um, when we left for this journey in 2018, we were really hoping that hopefully we can, we can uh, you know, visit Syria when it's no longer um, you know, in the middle of, uh, of, of a conflict or a war, but that wasn't the case. Uh, and by September last year, the only way you can visit was to um, book, a, book a guided tour, which we were actually quite happy to as well to do because you do, I mean, like I mentioned, we are both ex-tour guides. Uh, having a great guide, it really gives you an opportunity to see things and learn about the culture and, and experience uh, or go to places you would never find. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can probably guess, Just like, I'm just going to point out some of these pictures. So the one on the like the top left corner, mm -hmm. uh, that's us in Aleppo, the city in the northern part of Syria that was under siege. That's the citadel, and uh, is currently building. It was for us. It was actually quite emotional to walk through Aleppo because there's so much destruction and people slowly taking you know pieces of rocks and building their shops and homes like back up. But, so it was very sad, but then our guide was so happy to walk through and go like, oh, my God, this is so exciting, like, because he could see the progress. So yeah. it was, yeah, it was very, very emotional um, um, experience in Aleppo. Uh, the one to the right, those two uh, dudes with the hats that's in Damascus, in the capital. This is the vibrant market, which really it just, like, walking through, uh, and uh, we share this uh, through our Insta stories and everyone was just like, wow, it's amazing to see. And we had a lot of people from Syria actually following it uh, saying thank you for the peace of home. Uh, there was, yeah, there was just... Oh, Damascus, what an incredible city. It reminded us of somewhere like Istanbul or... Um, yeah, like, you know, some really cool... Very vibrant and... City in Middle East. Or, yeah. Yeah, it was... Yeah, yeah and... The picture on the right, so with the blue skies, that's one of the churches just outside of Damascus. So uh, maybe what many people don't know, but Syria is very similar to even like neighboring Lebanon. There's a bit of mixture of religions and, and, and people of different backgrounds. And when it comes to Damascus, you know, you have uh, that beautiful mosque, which is uh, at the bottom picture in the middle. And then you have this like incredible church is not far away and everything kind of coexists. Um, and has been there for a long time. Um, yeah, and then there was the food. I think the food. I mean, we need to talk about the food. I think. The food. Yeah. Top five. It's not their top five. I mean, I love Lebanese food and Syrian and Lebanese yeah. food are almost in the same pile, like it's fresh. It was delicious. Um, we ate as much as we could. We said to our guide, I want to eat everything. Like I, if I had a second stomach, I would have bring it. I would bring it. But, uh, yeah, he took us to some really great places and hole in the wall we ate some um you know, Aleppo kebab in Aleppo, and, but so there's little hole in the wall places that you couldn't find, and even hidden places that you would never find on your own. He would take us into, you know, an old building that looked like it had gone, but inside there'd be a big oven, and the guys are in there cooking little pizzas, and yeah. you know, show us and everyone's things like that. And I'm like, oh, I love this stuff. I live mm. for this yeah. this kind of thing. It was great. <laughs> and, in, and I think as well, like in the beginning, we were really kind of, you know. It was a strange feeling coming in and walking through this bustling city because Damascus is just that. And then our guy turned to turn around and said, "Like, please don't be sad. Like, we have enough sadness in Syria. Like, we want you to enjoy. Like, we want to laugh. We want to, you know." And that was yeah, like this smile, yeah, for please, every picture and sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just so. It was like a real roller coaster in emotions mm. traveling through the Syria. And I think if you know, the, the people who choose to go to places um, and, and some people consider, is it the right time to go or not? But majority of people we, we met, they were just like, no, we're so happy to see tourists. Like we used to have many tourists, um, you know, before. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of like a sign of some normality. And I, we both really hope that um, it's not going to be long that, you know, people can again like visit. Yeah.
It's nice to see Alep. I went to Syria in 2009, so well before uh, the conflict, right? So it was proper, it was a very, uh, as you say, right? Like quite a, I wouldn't say a very popular destination, but mm -hmm. you know, I was living in Dubai. So for me, I, I went there at the end of Ramadan. So in fact, Syria followed a different calendar than, than Dubai. So for them, it was still the last day of Ramadan. For me, it was already me following the Dubai calendar was already the first day of Eid. So I saw the last day of Ramadan and then all of it during that time. And I was yeah. with somebody who was Jordanian. So he spoke Arabic perfectly fine. Um, and so we took public transportation and we explored the country, like just following the trains. We took the train mm -hmm. from Aleppo to Damascus and, you know, crack the Chevalier and all of this. And I went mm -hmm. to Palmyra um, and I have all these beautiful photos, but it's nice to see that Aleppo is, at least the citadel from this angle looks a little bit similar to yeah. the pictures that I have from that time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. some other parts might not have survived as well, like Palmyra, I think, unfortunately, has been yeah. a casualty. We, mm, yeah. we, we, we tried to get to Palmyra, but we couldn't oh, We couldn't get the permit to get, so yeah. um, next time. It was very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So then from the hardest to the best. Well, yeah, I, it's hard to choose, I guess, we've had, I mean, Anyone that travels, it's all about the experiences. But just um, for these, some of our best experiences, for sure, I've named a few. Um, we've named a few on here. Um, definitely, one was seeing Mount Everest in Tibet. Um, we absolutely loved Tibet, and um, I think it was kind it's, of yeah, the standing at base camp there and um, getting up there when it's super, super, super cold. But just uh, you know, I think I, I actually came to quite emotional when we were there just like oh wow it's it's incredible um and again i think it's always the people of a, a country that you know make the the journey and the yeah. time so good and i really really love to and people mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah so that. And for all those who are who are watching who may think that you trekked you can drive all the way to mount Everest. <laughs> <laughs> from the tibetan yeah. side you can drive up there uh, and obviously from the Nepalese side, most people do the Everest base camp track, which is about 14 days. Uh, and then we, go, we yeah. climb to the top that we did not climb on Everest, seeing my Everest. <laughs> you walked, uh, I also did it, I did it a couple of years ago, and it's, you walk 150 meters, right? From 5,000 to 5,150, yeah. you walk, <laughs> and then yeah. that's it. And people think like, oh, you went to base camp. No, no I no. drove to base camp, let's <laughs> yeah. make a difference here. <laughs> Yeah, but the, but the night that we slept there, like, yeah. I, was I mean, I have a, I even have a picture of uh, I have um, star trails from that night because it was a clear night, and so we have the star trails, you know, mm -hmm. like all the stars around Everest. Uh, it mm -hmm. was freezing, freezing, and my friend did it because I was like freezing; I couldn't even feel my mm -hmm. toes. But he was drinking that amazing uh, Tibetan liquor that I think this thing was like probably would waken up at the dead, and yeah. that kept him from freezing, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember it. Um, yeah, and then, I mean, this one? So this yeah. is, yeah, I mean, I guess with like our experiences, we, we love being surprised by something we never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we were traveling through West Africa, which seemed like forever, because we spent <laughs> a lot, many months uh, going across countries, in Niger, we found out that there are these very rare West African giraffes. They look smaller than other African giraffes. And they were almost almost extinct. How many were they? Extinct. I think there was like eighty or so left. Yeah, at the time. And because yeah. uh, they were being hunted, because they used to eat uh, uh, crops, etc. So there was actual initiative made, and you can see that there's a group of um, you know kids and community uh, that lives nearby. They were all happy to say hello. So there was an initiative um, to get the communities involved in protection of these giraffes to essentially um, you know stop them from being killed, although they do eat all the crops, etc., to protect them. So then maybe there is a booming, not only like tourism industry, but obviously there can be, well, there can be West African giraffes in the future. So yeah. Uh, so this was, yeah, one of our most memorable, memorable days. Yeah. But now these, are, these are grown up. These are grown up giraffes. This is not a baby yeah. giraffe. Yeah, but they're yeah. a lot smaller and they have, yeah, they have different. But they sort of live, uh, they roam kind of freely within where all the communities live of, um, of the land, but there's about 700 of them now because, yeah. you know, that if they get a little piece of the pie now for helping look after the giraffes yeah. rather than um, killing them, so it all, yeah, yeah, it's it all comes together, and it was really cool to just be out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, nice! I love giraffes. I find them so cute. These ones look like 
I mean, like their what? neck is shorter, right? Like the legs are kind of the same, oh. but the neck is much shorter than the other giraffe. It's a little bit more forward, um, yeah. but yeah, very elegant. Yeah. yeah. So cute with the big eye eyelashes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah gorgeous. Um, who doesn't like giraffes? Yeah. Uh, this was in uh, Guyana country in the in South America, which is very unknown, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we found out that there is Kaichu Falls, which were incredible, but all you had to do is get on a flight out of this capital, and it's just tiny little, what was it, 10-seater? Yeah. Little eight, plane. Eight, so we waited for about four days, so there's enough people to fill the plane to go. Uh, it was a two-hour very really bumpy ride um, over the clouds, and then as you approach, in the middle of these, like, Amazon uh, just greenery looks like a little broccoli everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the waterfalls just pop out, and then once we land, and I think there was only like thirty people um, at the time yeah. with the indigenous guide, you know, explaining uh, explaining more about the waterfalls and and uh, and everything. So I think we we kind of we liked it more than Niagara Falls or yeah. some of the bigger ones, yeah, because it was so unique. It was, yeah, um, and it was yeah. just it was magnificent. It was beautiful. Yeah, so they're cool. cool. Mm -hmm. so you go there for the day and then you come back on the same plane. Yeah. So you literally like you fly over, you spend about two and a half hours, and then you fly back. So, so the flight itself, uh, you could you could you could actually go overland, but I think it takes about three or four days because yeah. uh, Guyana doesn't really have infrastructure. The, that doesn't have infrastructure, so it's kind of like road and then boat and then you track. So and yeah. then yeah, it's definitely the flight the infrastructure, and then it's it's very expensive to do something on your own because. Yeah, yeah, there's very little tourism. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, cool. Yeah. Cool. Ooh, the gorillas. I think that's on everyone's <laughs> bucket list. Uh, have, have, you done, have you done it yourself? No? Yes, I've done it in Uganda and in Rwanda. Oh, that's so, nice. you know, so uh, I mean, nice. I mean, this has been yeah, bucket list yeah. for a long time, considering all our travels. Uh, it took us years to get here. We were actually really, we were just blown away, Uganda. Like you can see the picture on the bottom, there's a rainforest and the landscape. It's mm. just so, so beautiful. Like you could call it the Switzerland of uh, of that part of Africa, or Africa in general. And obviously yeah. we, how long did we track for? With the, a couple of hours. A couple of hours. So we yeah. didn't, like I know people who spend like six hours trying to get through the forest. Uh, we had a little bit easier. And then obviously you get an hour to just observe the gorillas yeah so it's a fantastic experience right? you don't get tired of it yeah no, it's a cool. yeah and so. now that uh, i mean rwanda increased the prices the year that i went they increased the prices uh to 1500 whereas they, uganda is 600 i think uh yeah. now um yeah. which is why we chose so to go there that's why we as well yeah i mean it's literally uh, just across the border right it's the same yeah. as the same park yeah. right so i mean yeah. There is the option as well to go uh so the last country it's drc uh, congo which where it costs a little bit less, but um, yeah, there's a safety issues and sometimes the park is closed. So I think Uganda is the yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, during uh, the virus situation, there was an attack in some ranges, right? That some yeah. ranges, I think five people died right last month in the DRC, unfortunately. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's, yeah, we've been reading about it. It's, 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 yeah. it's very unfortunate, but yeah, gorillas is, I mean, it's just so much fun, right? To watch them for an hour, you feel like, oh my God, it's like my cousin, you know? They are yeah, so similar. Like just the expression is just so human-like, yeah. 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 It's incredible. Couch surfing in Iran, um, in itself, like we said, we loved Iran and we did quite a lot of couch surfing um, there and you literally are treated like, um, you know, an honoured guest everywhere you go and that was probably what made our time there super special and we stayed with a couple of different couples that we'd met through couch surfing um, mm. in Mashhad and Shiraz and other places. other places, but just because the the culture is so different, but you know, like Every, we said, we yeah. the hospitality and even eating and everything. I mean, everything takes stops, place in yeah. the home, and they the entire um, yeah the entire social entertaining social life happens behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So when you can, you know, when you can, you like you go to Spain and you can go out and you probably you know get Spanish nightlife like that happens in Iran, but it's all behind closed doors and yeah. yeah. People want the full, and then obviously there's a couple of pictures just of uh, what Iran is known for when it comes to architecture. Um, but yeah, yeah, we love the people. Yeah, but mm. exactly. 
Daniela says, how lucky you are to have each other as travel buddies. I'm looking, I'm always looking for someone to go with me, but hard to find people mm -hmm. who want to go at the same time and place. Yes, mm -hmm. I can, I concur with that. Although I always drag my best friend with me whenever I want to go. Yeah. And he's, a, he's a trooper. I we talk about this often, even like from the last two years, and particularly when we were traveling overland through many of those West African uh, countries. Like, you know, at times it got really tough and really, you know, mm. tiring and frustrating and, and all those kinds of things. But we always kept a positive um, yeah. mindset because you have to, to, yeah. to get through some of those places. But often I'd turn to Marty and say, I'd, I'm so happy that you're traveling. Yeah. You know, we're doing this together because. Um, just for the the company to share things and to share meals mm -hmm. and share experiences it's it's a beautiful thing yeah. so if you yeah have a friends but, or things that you can go with i mean yeah we know we're lucky like that but then when it does when it comes to like travel for solo females like i mentioned like i feel like when i was on my own then i i make more friends mm -hmm. um and then sometimes we as well we suggest to you know I know we all love, like, nobody stays in, like, hostels for the comfort. We usually stay there for the social atmosphere. Yeah. And uh, even when we travel, like, we often would get, like, just a private room instead of dorm. Or if there's a female dorm, it's like, oh, that's perfect. Uh, so we had some, like, yeah, we had some great experiences that way. So there mm -hmm. is different ways to maybe meet. And I uh, personally, like, I always think, like, if, if you can if you feel like i don't want to travel on my own or there's certain countries that you don't feel comfortable i said join a tour because you you also make friends like i have friends that travel with travel friends that they met while traveling so i think that there's like a little network yeah so. there's some amazing companies out there and there's yeah. something for everybody like different companies suited to what you're looking for the age group or the activities yeah. you'll be doing or interested in architecture mm -hmm. or food or whatever it is mm -hmm. um there's some amazing yeah companies yeah. so definitely join one of those like Marty and I worked for the same travel companies the way we met so that's kind of yeah um, true. that's kind of funny but yeah. like-minded I guess yeah yes I guess that when you go on a tour like that at least you're meeting people who have the same mindset as you and then you will find a travel buddy that will go with you in the next trip right a lot of people <laughs> mention that yeah. Um, yeah. I'm fortunate yeah. enough to have a best friend who shares my same like yeah. I, I would say craziness for adventure and for going to places that nobody wants to go to yeah. um, but you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a little bit of a uh, little bit of Europe. So this is actually right. Just touched on the fact that we did work in Europe as guides. So this is the midnight sun in Norway. So for those who don't know, if you're visiting Norway, you can drive up all the way to the top across the Arctic Circle and go to the very very top of Norway or of Europe. Uh, the place is called Nord Cap, um, and then the globe that you see. Uh, so that's the most northern point in Europe. And during the time, um, so during summer solstice, like June, when the longest day happened in northern hemisphere, the further north you go, then the longer the days. And when you come here, the sun never sets. So you experience in midnight sun. You're pretty much just watching the sun, looking at your watch going, now it's midnight and I can still sun. Mm -hmm. So that picture of us two, that's literally at midnight. And then that little green fjord, it's just a little bit of perspective of what you see along the way. It's a long way up there, but uh, definitely something put, to put on a bucket list, I think. So, yeah. Yeah. It's stunning. So that's what we did for job. It wasn't too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't too bad. Yeah. I wonder why you left that job. <laughs> so we kept um, going back. Yeah. yeah. And then in Antarctica, we, had, we were really fortunate to have the opportunity to go about two years ago. Oh, wow. Two or two and a half years ago, I guess, to Antarctica, mm -hmm. and uh, and we'd always wanted to go, but it was all, it always felt like it was a little out of our reach in terms of price, and that's why we put it off. Um, but we absolutely loved yeah, it. It was kind just, of almost like life changing. Yeah, I think the experience we had a fourteen day trip um, and the expedition, yeah. and just those sort of six six days that you spend going out on zodiacs like little rubber dinghies with the guides and the other people just viewing wildlife and mm -hmm. you know um, who doesn't like penguins right like, yeah i mean look at them right i mean don't you just want to give them a hug i mean so fluffy yeah. right i wonder if um, they are this fluffy in real life though have you did you touch them like are they fluffy or they no. just look it no so you can't you can't touch any wildlife but they come very close and they i think they, i would try to chase one you know like <laughs> yeah they, they actually try to like dip on our gopro uh, uh but so they're very very friendly very curious about the humans mm -hmm. and i think so are the seals i feel like you can just see that they yeah they interact with us they're um, very curious and whales and everything like 
it's, yeah and we get, we got to see a lot of whales actually whales sleeping in the water we were like right mm -hmm. just above them so yeah. just incredible and the landscapes as well they the landscape changes as you go down as well it isn't always like just like what do you see it's just eyes it's yeah. actually uh yeah a lot different so and you get to get on the line and step on antarctica and, so yeah. you did it uh, via the patagonia site uh, yeah, we've done it. So we flew from Buenos Aires down to Ushuaia and then uh, you spent two days uh, sailing across the Drake Passage to reach Antarctica and then we spent five days on the ship going seeing penguins and everything else. Yeah. Activities. We even did polar plunge where you jump into the water uh, and then, yeah, which was very, very cold. Then jump out. Uh, and then jump out and then crawl out. You can't really... Um, yeah, and then so you sail back to yeah, you sail back to Ushuaia, and then we flew back to Buenos Aires. Yeah, I mean, look at this penguin, right? I mean, seriously. Oh, that was that was, so that was a really cool encounter. Like, I was like, this is the best day ever. Yeah, <laughs> this penguin's <laughs> so interested in in me, and he was right here. So yeah, yeah. Cool. Who doesn't want to go to Antarctica, right? I mean, seriously, yeah. right? Yeah, mm. it's like National Geographic, really. You know, so. Uh, exploring Iceland in camp events. So this is yet another of our like, just amazing experiences. I think, I mean, Iceland becomes super popular mm -hmm. when they years ago, but we decided to return and uh, see a little bit more. So we had a camp event. That's that little picture of me just sitting there eating my food that obviously I didn't cook. Rachel I'm cooks. a chef. Yeah. yeah, Rachel always cooks. <laughs> Take care of the food. Um, uh. But it was, it, it was so beautiful. And somehow we were so lucky we had, sunny day like this for the whole week and even friend who's Icelandic goes like that just never happens I mean look at the rainbow like right there the waterfall like just it was perfect and I have to say this almost didn't happen because we missed our flight to Iceland because we went to the wrong airport <laughs> we actually went we went to the airport in the wrong country so <laughs> like how but yeah. so we went to Slovakia where I live and most of the people fly we have we have airport in Bratislava, which is about a half an hour drive. That's the capital. And we also have an airport in Vienna, which is in Austria, but it's only like an hour and a half away. So Slovakia has never built a lot of international flights because it's, there's no difference. It's like JFK and uh, LaGuardia or like Heathrow and Gatwick. So like you fly to one or the other. And because we were flying with Wizz Air, which flies out of Bratislava, I got my sister like, yeah, just drop us in. We checked in online, like, we just, you know, Bratislava is super efficient. Like, you walk to the gate in about less than 10 minutes. So when we got to the airport, they were like, mm, mm. this is Vienna. Yeah. So it's only an hour, not even an hour, 45 minutes to drive to the other airport. But yeah. we were already, like, we, we couldn't were make it. <laughs> because we were too late. Because we left it like, well, we just go straight to the, and we, uh, we you know, we travel with carry-on. So, yes, yeah, so I had to call my sister and say, like, we're at the wrong airport. And we decided to. <sighs> take a bus to Prague and we flew from we Prague, flew from the same Prague. Day, just because they had much better yeah. uh, cost. So this almost never happened, so I'm glad we, we did. And now we always check which airport and which country. <laughs> <laughs> which, like, it's the experienced travellers get it wrong sometimes yeah, too. It, it happens. It sounds <laughs> insane. And when this happened, a lot of our followers yeah. said, like, yes, it happened to me and I went to the wrong date and wrong month. And yeah. so it made us feel really good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it happens to everyone. It happens yeah. to the best of us. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So this is Rach can talk about this. A <laughs> um, favorite countries for food and food experiences. You know, the whole world offers amazing food and food experiences. But if you go to the next slide, some of our, I guess, some of our top six six countries um, that we would return to again and again. Thailand. I think people can guess them. Uh, yeah. You already said yeah. that. Uh, yeah, uh, if I, I guess there's a bit of a delay, right? Like, oh, you have the flags in there as well. But, you know, like, uh, I wonder if people would guess them. I kind of guessed, yeah, I, I guessed yeah. Yeah, them. I wasn't sure about Thailand um, because the dish for Thailand could have been other other places in Southeast Asia, right? Yeah. Um, it yeah, wasn't like a typical Thai dish, right? Yeah. Uh, but the other the other ones were obvious to me. Um, yeah. But I wonder if people would have uh, guessed them as well. Yeah. Um. And, be I mean, I have a guess for sure, but one of the things we, we do love about eating all around the world is we love street food um, and really happy to eat it. And I know some people are like, oh, I don't trust it, I don't do this. But I think there's certain rules that if you kind of follow them um, mm -hmm. in, in each country, 
um, you know, to recognise a place that looks clean enough to eat or go to the place where all the locals are eating and lining up out the door, it's going to be good, um, you know, and, and look at what people are eating and, and point mm. and say, I want that too. If you don't know, if you can't read the menu, just yeah. ask. Um, so we, we're big street food eaters and I guess we're kind of drawn to countries that have a lot of but, yeah. um, street food or little family-run places everywhere. Mm. But, yeah, Thailand is one of our favourite countries in the world and a big reason for that is food. I mean, all of Southeast Asia, you could send me there for the rest of my life and I'd be really happy because yeah. it's really cheap, amazing, affordable food. Um, but we both love it for that and it's everywhere. It's mm -hmm. Yeah, Did Street we? Food Central, I guess. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Right, right. Did anyone want to guess the other countries? Yes. Yeah. Have, have they guess? had a go? Mm, we got no volunteers. America. Ah. Um, so, yeah, so that's. Yeah, oh, yeah, about the street food, yes. Oh, yeah. I, I feel like you also grow um, tolerance for street food. I, when I was working <laughs> in Africa every week, I was never sick, right? Never. Never, but I also like brush my teeth with running water. I did like all sorts of stuff, and I was never sick, right? But uh, you know, you also lose the resistance if you if you stop eating, you know, food like that. At some point, you start getting sick again. I guess it's For yeah, sure. it's a step by step. But I, I know like Rachel always says that the good thing about street food is like you can see someone's kitchen, so you can see that it's spotless and and clean and, and everything. So sometimes when you go to a restaurant, you don't know what the kitchen is like. So we actually prefer to see what's cooking and where the locals go because yeah, they they yeah they gotta keep everyone happy, I guess, to come back. So yeah, for so sure. Thailand, absolutely. Uh, the second one is, as you guessed, uh, Mexico. Yeah, uh, we we actually we went to Mexico and uh, well, we were not sure how long we we're gonna stay. And Rachel said, like, as long as I tried all the dishes and we ended up staying the maximum of 90 days of our visa and had to actually leave because we were still eating. And mm -hmm. we did, we, we tried, like, learn Spanish and see different areas and et cetera. Mm -hmm. But Mexico so, is, is, I mean, I think people think that it's just tacos and burritos and that's yeah. about it. You know, there's oh. so much yeah. more yeah. in depth yeah. and really fine cuisine. Yeah. Um, in Oaxaca, the region was probably one of our favourite regions. You've probably been there, Ma, right? No, I haven't been to Oaxaca actually, but I love Mexican mm -hmm. food. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Oaxaca next. It's foodie central. Yeah, was... um, yeah, incredible. And we sort of learnt well. Yeah, kept practicing our our Spanish in Oaxaca while we were there, and I think even learning a little bit of the language always heightens any yeah. food experiences mm. you're going to have in each country. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Mexico for sure. So loved then, it. Yeah, so the third one, as everyone would guess, is Italy. I mean, who doesn't like Italian food? Like, really, I think even gluten-free people love Italian food because it's actually quite easy for, for, for uh, if you're gluten-free, because you just get a gluten-free pasta and everything is still delicious. Mm -hmm. um, they have so many different types. I think you can eat a new dish every day. Uh, but we all go like, oh, yeah, pizza, pizza, pizza. But they have so many different variations and also regionally, uh, and they take real pride in their produce, so we do love that. And food brings people together. I mean, generally. So, but this would be, I think, like I would kind of top three. And then, of course, we wanted to add a couple of bonuses. So, that picture of Ethiopian food, we touched on it before. Yeah, um, we're big fans. <laughs> yeah. So we we this really is a handsome injera, I must say. This looks like a nice one. Yeah, this was a really good one. Yeah. And I think as well, we have had. We have had food in Ethiopia that was exceptional, and of course, there was good food. So I think as well, depending on the the bread, I can see what you meant. That sometimes it's quite can be sour, and yeah. and sometimes it's it's you don't you don't taste it. Uh, this was a really good one, uh, vegetarian, and I think a lot of the times people mm -hmm. struggle maybe planning trip when they're vegetarian or even vegan. Yeah. So uh, I think we were lucky with Ethiopia because. Because we actually had a friend, oh, well, someone who reached out to us on uh, Insta Instagram. Yeah, he yeah, knew that we Gina. were. We said mm -hmm. we we're going to Ethiopia. He reached out and said, uh, "I would love to meet you in the capital, and I would love, I want to show you the food and introduce you to all the food and some places because I know mm -hmm. you're real foodies." And they're like, "Okay, let's do this." Um, and he was he's one of the best human beings ever. Yeah, he's an amazing cool. person. Um, so much fun, but he introduced us to some of the food and mm -hmm. um, it. it Again, it's one of those things and where, where to eat as well. I told you, yeah, where to eat and like the nightlife in Ethiopia was really cool, and it was nice to have a local to take us, you yeah, know, to do all those things and yeah, we've been and in. have that inside yeah. knowledge, I guess. But yeah. next one was Syria. We've already talked about that. 
Um, but 10 out of 10. Yeah, it almost represents like a Middle Eastern, like Lebanese food. We love so a lot of the culture. things, a lot of the dishes can be found um, across a few countries. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much. I mean, who, you, yeah. you find the same even in Turkey, right? Turkey, yeah. Lebanon, even even parts of Greece, right? You find the same ingredients. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, last one. And last one was Georgia, which so which we this, talked about. And I think Georgian food for me, it, I love it so much because it's like real comfort food. Yeah. Um, and then on the other side, they, um, you know, they cook with lots of like walnuts and garlic and paste and mm -hmm. fresh herbs in a really cool blend. But they cook with love, and I, I love that when I travel, and I always talk about that ingredient. Is they've they've cared about that, and they've they've cooked that with love, which is my favorite ingredient. This, you can tell why we have this eat sign behind us now. Yeah. Talking about this, um, and yeah. this dish, just so for those who don't know, it's called kachapuri. It's ultimately bread that's filled with egg and like salty cheese, salty and cheese, butter. and probably like a quarter of a stick of butter. Yeah. And then <laughs> terrible for your arteries, terrible, but really good and great. Like if you go hiking, it's just it's a whole day that gets you through the whole entire day and yeah. then you drink a bottle of wine at night because mm -hmm. it's really good too as we know mm -hmm. and then you you're sorted <laughs> yeah so i think we can be friends i think i see that you like bread as much as me and wine yeah. bread Marty, bread. I, I am from slovakia so yeah. bread forever like, yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> i cannot live without bread right i mean <laughs> i can basically just live off bread that's it I, I, i'm happy with bread any kind yeah. of bread right any kind of bread is good yeah uh, and we have a couple of, I think, in the next slide, we just have a couple of experiences and they bring people together. So, yeah, um, food experiences, exactly. Like one of our favorites traveling through the stands. The first picture, yeah. the first picture there was in Tajikistan. Um, we were just wandering through the fields in the Wakan Valley, um, this beautiful, beautiful area. And these ladies were working in the field and it was lunchtime mm. and we were kind of wandering, just taking photos. And they all stopped and to obviously have lunch and their, their kids, their boys brought them over all these pots and things and they sat down in the middle of the field and then in a moment one of their arms comes up and he's like, come on over, like becking at, you know, waving for us to come over and I'm like, is she looking at us? We're the only people there. Um, and then they, they, again, you know, there's 10 women and then we're like, okay, let's go. So we jump over the, the field and over to the circle and in sort of, Broken Russian yeah. and a bit of German. Because they're like, do you speak German? I'm like, yes. They didn't. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, you don't. Um, they invited us to eat with them in the field and, um, you know, hot tea, the most beautiful food. It was home cooked, obviously, and, and brought over. Yeah. And it, uh, it actually, because mm -hmm. when you talked about the bread, mm -hmm. I remember the lady like raising the bread and going, you see this? And we were sat, obviously, in a field and it was wheat. So she oh. goes, it's bread. Mm -hmm. And Rach said, like, I have never seen the, the close connection with food demonstrated yeah. because everything that they eat is what they produce. So, yeah, yeah. it was definitely the highlight. Was, <laughs> yeah, it was such a good experience. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I didn't stop smiling for about three days. Yeah. Um, yeah, the after that. Great. But that one for sure. Um, the second picture is what we mentioned. So in Ethiopia, this is us in a in the backyard of a family that our friend said, hey, you come to my friend's house and they'll cook mm -hmm. endura and all of those little curries and you can see a little tray uh, of coffee because then in Ethiopia, coffee is yeah. like, you know, like, like a religion. They have a whole ceremony and the coffee is very, very good. Uh, and they always roast the beans fresh and then they make the coffee. So I think we sat there for about three, four hours. And mm -hmm. um, once again, like just wonderful experience. Uh, below that, we have a photo from Chad, which is a country that majority of people uh, just kind of go through. Uh, you, you, you as well, like from safety perspective, you can't see a lot of the country, but mm -hmm. we got in touch with these guys. Um, and actually the two guys uh, on the left, uh, they're originally from Turkey. And they said, yeah, well, let's go and do lunch. So yeah. we went to, um, they were working in Chad. Mm -hmm. So they said, oh, we'll take you to a place that do fish really well. So here we are in Chad, which is not a foodie country, but we had still a really great food experience. Yeah. Um, so there's a little photo. So in the middle, there's a tray with the fish and bread. And stuff, yeah, it, so. was, it was fantastic. It was just this little yeah. shack down near the water where they pulled the fish from the lake and then yeah. cook it um, with very little, you know, capacity to do so but it was it was fantastic and then the other photo there is in Taiwan but 
any um, any countries or places where there's going to be food markets, you will find us there. Is, yeah. Um, yeah, so Taiwan has, has some exceptional Nine street market, street market food market, yes. Lot, you know, through a lot of Asia, um, but those were, were really cool and, yeah. Yeah, we definitely put on weight there, <laughs> but that's okay. But um, that's yeah. okay, you know. You can go okay. trekking for a day, and you know, you just yeah, go cool. a little bit of sightseeing, or yeah, that's why we call very hungry now, man. Yeah, eat. <laughs> yeah, that's the rule. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so this, yeah, that's. Oh, um, and finally, you have your safety tips. Yes, yeah, so um, cool. somebody cool. asked at the beginning, and of course, you have been to. 186 countries, and you were tour guides before, so you, I think that you're quite qualified to give tips, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll really. So these are like three of the tips. Uh, first of all, uh, like when it comes to safety, we always like research your destination. What makes it unsafe? It's different to go to Switzerland as Congo. So um, a lot of lot of countries and a lot of places are actually very safe for females, and there's no need to be like hiding in your room. Uh, I think when it comes to Europe, and I mean, you yourself, you live in Singapore, like there is no um, no major safety issues. Uh, and doing that research before you go, you might have cities like Barcelona or Rome, which are no more for pickpocketing. Uh, and then maybe others that recommend not to, you know, walk on the streets late at night. So I think the most important thing is like research your destination yeah. uh, because there's no really need to be scared about places when there's no need. And then obviously, um, yeah, to yeah. know more about yeah exactly. places that, that maybe knowledge uh, is power. Yeah, yeah, knowledge is power, yeah. exactly. In the Pre preparation. Um SIM card. SIM card. Say? Definitely. Um, definitely I mean, even now you can get a SIM card for really cheap. You can definitely mm. get even if it's for a couple of gigabytes, uh, we always get a local SIM. Normally we just get one, we use one phone. Um, and yeah. yeah, just to know where you are, and sometimes to navigate, you know, in your head to know where you're going, where you are. Mm -hmm. If you get lost, it's easy enough to find your way home, or even just to Google yeah. something simple to. Yeah, and for peace research. of mind, for peace of mind, like maybe look at your roaming charges. So when you arrive somewhere, you know you're connected straight away. Yeah. Uh, I think um, that really helps. Um, and our last tip was, uh, oh yeah, friends and family. Just yeah. tell tell your friends and family. I have the like simple rule, like I just call my mum every weekend and then just tell her what I have been up to, where I'm going. Um, and I think it just then like from here and there we hear about someone who like oh someone's gone missing because they haven't called their mum as soon as they arrived. So I think the expectations that they are there and yeah. keep in touch. Um, but yeah, there's there's some more. I think there's S some more tips, write, on some website, tips on our website. Yeah. We've wrote about the yeah. Past like practical sort of step by step. Yeah. Um, so this is our Instagram channel. I think when it comes to our journey, we try to share uh, a lot of advice on our website, but let's start with our uh, Instagram. So uh, yeah, plenty of stories, plenty of photos of places often people don't visit. And uh, when we do travel, we do daily Insta stories and we do save them as well on our profile. So we have about 50, so you can scroll back and yeah. look at something from wherever we've been, Micronesia to yeah. uh, where we were before, <laughs> Madagascar or Syria. Know, we have Syria stories yeah. still there. So, But I guess on our Instagram, we, we really try to educate um, and help people learn about new countries also or, you know, educate as we go, right? It's mm. important yeah. because if you, if you understand the country and we're learning as we go too. So we like to share that um, on our platform. But the, the stories can be yeah. funny, they could be real. Yeah. And as you can yeah. see, I, I like that you're not, uh, you don't put uh, your filters and change things. You're quite uh, genuine. So it makes it more interesting, I think. Good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see how many we can guess from the, from the page. I would say the first one is Uzbekistan. But it could also be Iran or Afghanistan, yes. to be honest. Could be any of them, right? That's it's the same right. similar yeah. kind of like architecture of yeah. Central Asia. The, Moga, the the Mongols mm -hmm. and, and all of that uh, sort of architecture. The second and third, I'm not quite sure. It could be so many places. Yeah. The third one, I would uh, say, is Maldives, but it could also be Indonesia. Yes, or... yes it is. Maldives, <laughs> actually, yeah. So we have uh, the, the palm tree was Cook Islands, and then the beautiful beach is Maldives. Oh, was it? Turks and Caicos. Turks and Caicos, and then Maldives is next to it. 
Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I would say Guyana just because you showed pictures, but I have yes. no idea. Yes. And then yeah. I would say Uganda um, or Rwanda or something like that. Yeah, correct. Next one. Mm -hmm. Good, good run. Uh, then maybe Macedonia? No. Could be Switzerland as well. You know, Switzerland, yes. Yeah. Or Slovenia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, could be. And then obviously the bottom ones, because uh, you showed some pictures already, that was Syria, right? Uh, the one in the middle, I'm not quite sure. Mm, that sort of bread, yeah, the food one. I mean, that sort of <laughs> bread could be anywhere in the Balkans or in like, uh, you know, Azerbaijan even. That was Afghanistan. That was a meal we had with the, the women inside yeah. the home in exactly. Afghanistan. Right. Yeah. And then those two uh, could be Pakistan, Afghanistan, one of those countries. Yes, yeah. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. The very last one is... That one is Afghanistan and then North Korea. Yes, yeah. North Korea. Nice. <laughs> pretty much 100 percent there so apart from the uh, well some of them uh, i i was guessing obviously uh, some of the things you can't really tell right the first one i'm pretty sure i saw places like this in uzbekistan right um bukhara or samarkand are like mm -hmm. similar to that um mm -hmm. and then somebody's asking in the comments if anybody has questions for them before we close this is your chance uh daniela is asking if you lead food tours maybe that's your next business idea if you want, sorry. If you lead food tours, ah, oh. usually for our friends, <laughs> no. when they we used, do. When, when they, they used to come to Melbourne, when they come um, to Melbourne, yeah, we uh we take them around different neighbourhoods and yeah, friends but and family and stuff. Could be a possibility when we see every country to maybe settle down and take settle. people on food um, tours. When we settle in one place, possibly because obviously it's my passion, mm. it's my full full passion. Um, but food, yeah, food and food tours. But we do, we actually, we do a lot of food tours when we travel because we do yeah. think that really great way to learn about culture, the people, and then food. Sometimes they look like they cost a lot more money, but you're getting food. You're not just getting the, the guided. So, um, so we've done plenty yeah. of those and we do have some of our like uh, favorite food tours listed on our website. So we do have a special category. Uh, so if you ever look into going, let's like, just say, you know, I don't know, Prague or Barcelona or wherever, yeah. uh, check it out because we might have a link to the food tour that we have done or that we know that it's really good from, from as well, like, you know, friends and other people. So, yeah. yeah. And tell me, uh, I think we have another slide, right, with some of your tips. Uh, yeah, so this is our website, Very Hungry Nomads, very easy. And these are just three of our blogs. Like, there's plenty of them, but when it comes to, like, tips and advice, these are the kind of key that, a lot of our followers and, and readers love. Uh, so we have a blog, our best travel tips from 15 years, and then the 20 jobs that pay you to travel the world. Very common, how do you afford to you know, travel? So best way to maybe combine work, as, as we mentioned, we were ex-tour guides, so we traveled for work. Yeah. And then of course, the ultimate packing list. Uh, yeah. We travel with the carry-on of eight to nine letter. kilos. Yeah, 40 liters. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. You did the two years with the carrier? Yes. Yeah. 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 So we almost like, we literally like, we'll never check in our luggage. Uh, and we probably checked in our luggage like three times in the last three years. And when we did that in the Pacific, <laughs> mostly just because I didn't want to like unpack as they were constantly taking out things. I'm like, oh, I'll just check it in. And that's when my bag gone missing and it took like three and a half weeks. Uh, Cause it was actually sitting in Kiribati this whole time, country we haven't even been. <laughs> So it's like, at least my bag is having a good time. So, yeah. so Marty pretty much wore my clothes, you know, yeah, for the next was three, three weeks. And not easy to, to pretty find, funny. find clothes in Marshall Islands. So. No, it wasn't. I would say that this is a challenge, right? Next time you should travel with only one carry-on. Yeah, <laughs> I think the more you travel, then the, like, the, the less and less you really need. So, yeah. yeah. That is That's true. It. That is true. I once uh, a few years ago, I spent two months in the Pacific by myself, and I felt I I just kept shipping things back home because really? I was like, I don't need these things. I'm just wearing the same shorts every day anyway. I'm wearing the same flip flops every day. I'm wearing the same bikini every yeah. day. Why do I carry five pairs of trousers and ten t-shirts and five mm -hmm. bikinis when I'm only using one? So I started shipping things home. So when I yeah. came back, I had far less than when I left. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah was all so that's what's in our pretty much our down to the very last item. That's what we travel with. If you want to keep things uh, light or just you know the essentials, I guess that we we travel with, yeah. which works because we've just done two years and 
Yeah, no, we're still we're still and, here. <laughs> and we've traveled through places you you can't really just pop into like H and M and pick up a pair, mm. uh, as, especially like we we virtually didn't buy anything in really like half a year maybe from West Africa. Like because we went from Morocco overland all the way down to Angola. Like, I think that was probably like the region when just yeah it was either like getting a typical dresses um, from the ladies or yeah. or, or, or just, maybe just yeah did a lot of hand washing. Yeah, we become a good little hand washer, yeah, but that's uh, that's part of it all. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me before we finish, what are you what are you planning to do when you complete? Um. Well, we yeah. I mean, we 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 really like. We actually journey. don't know when we're gonna complete the journey. We will try uh, as soon as we can. Uh, we might be able to maybe visit some of the Pacific countries. Mm. Um. But at the moment, like we're working on a new plan and we're hoping to announce it later on this week. Uh, we've just been working on a new project. So fingers crossed, that's all gonna go through. So yeah. uh, for that's our really followers and any new followers, stay tuned. Change, um, right? And then really as soon as, currently Australians can't leave the country. So, uh, yeah. which is very different to maybe other parts of the world because we get a lot of messages like, hey, like Croatia's opening up or, or you know Cyprus or, or this and that. Um, it's very different for us, and we've been told that 2021. So um, six we'll or seven months. Yeah, yeah it's we're going to be here. Yeah, yeah let's, let's see how everything goes. So, are you going to write a book or something like that? Are you going to go back to find a regular job, um, or are you going to go back to to your old jobs, or maybe yeah. lead food tours? This is where you recorded it first. <laughs> Daniela was the one to ask you. Yeah, hypotheticals. We've been asked a lot if we're going to write a book and. I mean, we certainly have a lot of content, a lot of stories and, um, yeah, wacky things to put in there. Yeah. So it, it's there's a possibility. We, yeah, yes. there's something yeah. we've definitely thrown around and uh, yeah. might be a possibility yeah. for sure. And in terms of work and jobs, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we'll see what the future brings. We're always open to new opportunities. and um, yeah. yeah. I don't think we'll go back to, I mean, maybe, but I don't think I'll go back to the job that I was doing a couple of years ago. But um, we'll see. Yeah, yeah we'll see. It'll definitely, I'm thinking, be in tourism or travel in some. It always has been. We've always both worked in, yeah, travel and tourism in some aspect or another. So it'll, we have we have had this crazy idea that maybe we can work for uh, on the ships until Antarctica. So like, <laughs> you know, see the penguins pretty much just like as our nine to five. So imagine if you can see them every day, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that eventually you can probably pat them. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, love seasonal yeah. work. Well, even like because that's what we kind of did in Europe. It's yeah, seasonal so work. Years. So six months on, you know, you work very hard um, for six months, but then you have six months off to go. Oh, sure, you could get another job, but we just yeah. took that money and then go somewhere warm and cheap. Yeah. yeah, go somewhere warm and cheap with good food and sun. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. all we need. So. Sounds yeah. like a good uh, sounds like a good combination, right? What else do you need? Good sun, good yeah. food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What else do you need? Well, you live in Singapore, so you have all of that. So, uh, yeah, it's sun, and yeah, you can have pretty much every food in the world. You can go to the hawker center and have pretty much any Asian food, at least uh, off the shelf, for like a couple of dollars. Um, yeah. Lee is asking, what was your daily budget for the two years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we started, um, we wanted to try and do it all on fifty US dollars each per day, and within that budget, it was. That included everything, so all our flights, accommodation, visas, transfer, you know, uh, transport, food, fun stuff, fun stuff, sightseeing, yeah, drinks, all that sightseeing. Yeah. Um, and then I guess two years later, so we do sort of keep tabs on what we spend. Um, budget, uh, you have to budget because that's the only way we're going to get yeah. through it. And we have gone a bit over that, um, mostly you. To the the visas, yeah. we actually like uh, majority of countries we're visiting in Africa. It was 100 to 150 US dollars per visa, and then just just Ooh. really kills your budget. Yeah. And then of course, a couple of those island nations where you did need to fly. That's important. So if you take out, if we even take out the flights out, then we yeah. way below the budget. So, below. but I'm not forgetting like that's sort of for the countries that we had just to complete the rest of the journey, but years ago if it depends on what part of the world you're traveling also you know you can definitely do and we did southeast asia on 30 us dollars a day living very yeah. very well or south america it was 30 mm. 35 us dollars each per right. day yeah. um and that's 
yeah, yeah. what we what we spent and that was in sort of mm. being really really frugal. So you, you would have probably been on on the hundred dollars per day together if you had averaged the whole count, the whole world, right? Just that you had probably already done the easier, cheaper places anyway, yeah. right? Was, yeah, yeah, because they always ask us like how how you know how much do you need to see every country, but we don't really know because it's been really fifteen years in the making, and now with everything that's happening, it might be twenty years in the making. Yeah. So um, and some countries can be really expensive, but then we'll definitely make it up with the next one, and the budget will kind of go. Oh, you know, mm. and we we make it work. Somehow. Yeah, in some countries you don't really have a choice, right? Because it's just yeah. if this no. is expensive, then you maybe even have to go on a tour, and then you need to get a guide, and then everything yeah. is very expensive, and then you need to get private transportation because there's like no other way to get stuff, mm -hmm. and then it just adds up, right? Whereas some countries, even in Europe, are really cheap, right? I remember going to Kosovo yeah. and thinking, how can it be so cheap? I just had an ice cream for 20 cents. This this was last summer, right? This was not 10 yeah. years ago. An ice cream for 20 cents. I mean. How is that possible? And then you go have lunch and it's two euros and you're like, okay, like okay. really cheap, right? Kosovo, Macedonia, Albania, even Montenegro to a degree, very yeah. affordable countries, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even my country, Slovakia, like it's very much undiscovered. Most people still travel to neighboring like Poland or Czech Republic or even mm -hmm. Hungary. And even Rachel was just like, it just offers such a good value and there's plenty to see as well. This has never been really... Uh, kind of pitch and promoted and like the neighboring countries like we, we have some obviously tourism but compared to let's just say to Slovenia like it's just yeah not on the same scale and mm -hmm. and it's yeah great gives you a lot for your money so they should be on the underrated list they should be on the round rated yeah yes I was expecting that you would put uh, Slovakia somewhere <laughs> yeah 2021 Slovakia because at the moment I don't think it's so easy <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah um, well, I know that uh, you could. Uh, I could have you here forever and ever, uh, and it's very late for you. So thank you so much for making it so late. It's almost midnight in Australia. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time and putting all the slides together. It's been a, a really nice uh, um, evening for me to have like a even like a little tour uh, with you, and I'm sure that everybody else will be uh, very grateful as well. So just for everybody one last time, uh, this is veryhungrynomads.com is their blog. You can go and find everything there and also on Instagram, veryhungrynomads as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so and much for having us, Mar. We yeah. really I think we're going to have more and more questions on the thread, so you might want to, tomorrow maybe you need to jump in and answer all the other <laughs> questions that everybody continues to have for you. Yeah, we'll have a copy in the morning and we'll answer any questions. Yeah. That Happy, happy to do that for sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, Great. I look forward to following your uh, trip and your announcement this week. Yes, yes. that's going to happen. Uh, okay. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much then. And yeah, good night, I guess. For now. Yeah, so, good night for you too. <laughs> waking up. So yeah. thank Thanks, you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao.